the uh, tip that we we always emphasize is to um, not double barrel it, I guess, like not to ask too many questions because you really want them to focus on a single thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, our respondents are supposed to pick which one they like and they're supposed to give a reason why. Um, but if you try to say like, and what about this? And what about this? And what about this? You know, like three questions in a row, like it's, you know, the, the data is going to be less useful. Um, the other thing I would say, and this is, this is for all testing is that you, you want to try to keep the variations uh, to a minimum. Like ideally you're only varying one thing at a time, right? So uh, you're not changing the color and the text at the same time, because then you're not going to know really what, what the factor was. Mm -hmm. um, and we see a lot of, we see a lot of this when, you know, authors, for example, might be testing a different book title and a book, different book cover style at the same time. And it's like, no, 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 get the book title right then move on to the book cover design and then test the, the stylistic things around the, the, the cover, but don't, don't be changing both at the same time. Um, so I guess most broadly it's best served by anyone who's just kind of analytical or like data minded. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what we see across the different industry, seg industry segments. Um, within different in industry segments, we've got, uh, what we started with was on for entrepreneurs. Um, that was kind of tough because like self-funded entrepreneurs like ourselves, like don't want to spend money on things. So that, that was a little bit of a tough nut to crack. Uh, so the first uh, other industry was authors, actually self-publishing authors. They discovered us to test book titles and book covers because it's something that uh, traditionally there wasn't a lot of testing around. You publish it and you can, you can't test it live. Mm -hmm. You don't want to take it back. There's a lot of costs involved, especially, especially with actual publishing. And I think uh, with the Tim, Tim Ferriss uh, for our work week, he talked about testing his book titles with Google ads. And so I think there was like um, some information out there about being data driven on your titles. And so that was kind of a movement that, uh, that was taking shape, especially in the self-publishing arena where you didn't have a, a publisher and editor that was helping you make these choices. Uh, so that was great actually. Like, and, and we still get a lot of uh, great authors testing on our platform. Um, Soon after that, we, we discovered that there were mobile game and mobile app companies using it because similar problem, right? Where there's a, there's a large um, uh, development costs. Um, when you publish an app, like you can't really take stuff back. Mm -hmm. You can't test on the, on the app store live in most situations. So a lot of people were testing all these creatives and when, whether they're app icons or app store screenshots or even the game creatives or app UI, um, so that they can just get feedback before sending it off to their very expensive development teams. Um, and the, the newest segment, which we discovered a couple of years ago, which has been super exciting because um, e-commerce has just been taken off. So the advent of these uh, uh, people selling on Amazon or Shopify, and you just have a lot more entrepreneurs and independent people selling products. And um, products is the ultimate thing where, you know, you're going to spend $50,000 on your product Mm -hmm. And you kind of need to make sure that it's the right product, it's the right design, the packaging's correct, the branding is correct. Um, when you get it on onto the listing on Amazon, you want to make sure you've got the right photo and the copy and all this kind of stuff. So there's multiple data, multiple points where you should be collecting data on what you know how people react to it and whether it's positive or negative. I guess I would say that it was a pretty traditional, you know, family dinner table. My you know, we would eat together with uh, my older sister. I have two younger brothers uh, that are twins, so a family of four. And my parents would take turns cooking. Uh, so my dad actually did a lot of the cooking um, because he had a shorter commute and, you know, was into cooking. So uh, I think that was actually a big influence on me. I actually end up doing a lot of the cooking now for my family. Um, but yeah, I think it was pretty traditional. Um, you know, no, low drama, I would say. Very cool. <laughs> what, what was your favorite dish that your dad would cook? What brings you back to, to those days? I don't remember what my favorite dish, but there's a dish that stands out that he would always cook that we would, that would frustrate us. It was, um, <laughs> he, he would cook this fresh shrimp Chinese dish uh, with the shell on. Oh, and wow. as it's like, we always hated it because we had to take the shell off and we would make him take the shell off and, um, we would always complain. He's like, yeah, but 
when the shell's on, like the shrimp is fresher and like it tastes better. And we're like, ah, it's so frustrating. And so <laughs> it's funny because like that memory is like so seared into my mind. And when we go to a restaurant and we order it, it's just, it's just a funny, uh, you know, flashback to it. Brings so, you back. That's great. That's yeah. great. So, so, so growing up, did you have any uh, businesses that you started, you know, in school? Were you the kid selling any candy or anything like that? Any, any early entrepreneurial habits that were forming? You know, not really. Um, I don't think it had even crossed my mind at that time. I think, um, you know, before college, actually, I, I was just really into to playing basketball and kind of all the normal kid stuff, video games and all that kind of, um, you know, leisure activities. And even going into college, I thought I was going to go into physical therapy or something, something like that. I wanted to be involved in like some kind of sports medicine and um, be around like sports and athletes and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. That was actually my intent when I applied to college. Um, what I discovered was that I, I would need a graduate degree for that. So I ended up applying to something, uh, an unrelated major just to kind of kill the time. And so I applied to um, computer science. Uh, and then that kind of changed the trajectory of, of everything. Mm -hmm. And, and I, obviously you had the background in programming. Um, when you started some of your companies, um, did you see a, a need that, or uh, something that was missing that you figured that you could, you know, program something to, to be able to solve that need? And uh, if so, what was, what was that, that niche that you were trying to solve? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I guess first and foremost, we, my partner and I, my partner, John and I, uh, both wanted to start a company more out of just like wanting to, you know, we had the entrepreneurial bug and we wanted to see what it was like to be our own bosses and not have to own up to anyone and, um, you know, chart our own path. Uh, after school, we had uh, both gone to large companies because we had graduated around the dot-com bus. So I went to Hewlett Packard, he went to Microsoft, kind of like the largest possible tech companies that you could go to. Um, and after a few years of that, we both just got, you know, kind of bored out of our minds. So we decided that we just we were going to start something and whether that was a software company or or we were exploring bars and restaurants and like you know literally anything like we we had this huge whiteboard where we just threw up like every possible idea and we we came up with some kind of scoring system where we just arbitrarily gave it like a one through ten like feasible interest and just you know some way to judge it right um somehow the idea around restaurants and you know, John had like this uh, drawer of restaurant menus that he's like, oh, this has got to be solved. Like, well, why are we still using paper takeout menus and all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. So we're like, all right, well, let's go into like the restaurant listing menu aggregation um, business. And so that's that's kind of where it started. And so we decided to quit our job like the following Monday and um, just go for it. And so, um, yeah, we, we kind of saw a need for uh, kind of having that information digitized and online and available for for diners and so that's that's how the first uh company started back in 2006. yep and, and that was menuism i take it yep yep that was menuism yeah that's that's great so talk about some of the challenges that you guys ran into when you were creating a, your first software business obviously you had a background in software but I'm sure there's probably a lot of ups oh and yeah downs. there were there were millions of challenges I, the first challenge was, was pretty funny is that we actually never built a, a website of that scale ourselves so like john was doing a, a different kind of software microsoft working on their phones uh, i was actually doing a lot of project management stuff at hp so like we weren't even really well equipped to to be building it um the first trip uh, the first thing we did is we went to the Barnes and noble um, and bought like a Ruby on Rails tutorial guide on how to build websites. And so the first couple of weeks were just really like, how do we build the website from scratch? How do we deploy it uh, to a live state and all this kind of stuff? So um, it was a lot of learning, it was a lot of challenges. Uh, so there was a lot of technical hurdles from that standpoint. Um, and then kind of like as the, the business grew, there were a lot of challenges around, um, you know, 
were we actually going to go around collecting and digitizing menus? Mm -hmm. Like what are the costs involved? We really wanted to self fund it. So, you know, we didn't want to go raise money and then have to pay an army of people to go around collecting menus. So like it was, there were a lot of challenges from that standpoint. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so you, you have this idea, you started programming it. Yeah. How did you actually go out and, and get some of your first customers? And then how did you scale that? Because again, like you said, going around restaurant to restaurant and grabbing their menus and you know, digitizing those, that's, that's quite a task. So did you, did you come up with any, any way to be able to automate that or, or systematize that? Yeah, so we kind of took a two-pronged approach. Um, one is we started uh, ingesting kind of like dish level data organically. So we, we were kind of one of the earliest uh, review sites that allowed people to rate dishes down, rate restaurants down to the dish level. So when you wrote a review about a restaurant, you could actually say like, I had the, you know, the chicken curry or whatever, and, and you could rate it. And that would kind of organically be added to this menu that we had. And so, you know, maybe in the beginning, there would only be a few dishes on the menu for a given restaurant, but um, that, that organically built up as, as people could write reviews. And then secondarily, we started partnering with people who were doing that stuff. So there were other companies that were digitizing menus and there were other uh, online ordering and delivery companies that were obviously had online menus. So what we started to do was take a more of a partner approach to going out and finding all those uh, sources and then aggregating them into like a, a single place. So, um, you know, we didn't want to incur the cost of like owning that constant updating. And so we just became more of a menu aggregator. Got it. Got it. Okay. And, yeah. and your, was your revenue stream, was it basically advertising based or how were you guys funding it? How were you making money? Off yeah. So as, as we've kind of evolved the, the business model, like we had to make decisions around like what kind of business structure we wanted to run, right? Like obviously if we wanted to have feet on the ground or if we wanted to have a sales staff, like that was going to be a much larger, larger organization. Um, potentially requiring us to raise money. I think for this uh, for this particular business, we wanted to run it as as lean and automated as possible. So um, we we took a few attempts at like setting up restaurants, and we're like, all right, this is this is not for us. Um, kind of early on, we had met uh, Chuck Templeton, who had founded Open Table, and he had come on as an advisor, and he had actually advised us not to go down that sales route because he's like, you know, I spent a lot of time doing that myself and then building up a sales team. And um, he knew how we wanted to run the business. He's like, that's, that's not a route that you guys should go down. And so he actually helped us kind of craft that partnership uh, approach to things. And uh, so then we decided to focus more on advertising. We got really good at uh, optimizing uh, the different types of display ads, uh, you know, uh, embedded text ads, all that kind of stuff. So um yeah, we got pretty good at that. And, uh, you know, we had a pretty strong uh, SEO profile. So the combination of organic search and the ads uh, worked pretty well for that business. That's cool. That's very cool. Excellent. Yeah. So you, you, you did that for a number of years, correct? Yeah. And then yeah, well, it's, actually, it's still running. It's still running oh, to this day. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So, so menuism is still running. At what point did you say we need to jump into something else and, um, or, or what, what did you see in the market that was missing and what prompted you to, to jump in to do the next business? Yeah. Uh, so we actually built, uh, well, I guess stepping back, like we had always wanted to run a portfolio of companies. Like that was our goal was to self fund and run a portfolio of companies that had multiple revenue streams so that we were tied to any particular thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of worked well for like an entrepreneurial ADD that most, most of us have. Mm -hmm. And um, so in 2008, which was only about yeah, two, uh, two years after we started Pick Fu, uh, we, uh, John and I were working on a redesign for menuism and we, we came to like a stalemate on like which design we wanted to do because there were two of us and, you know, <laughs> we couldn't decide. Um, we had been soliciting feedback from friends and family, obviously, for the past couple of years. And at a certain point, like people got kind of get sick of giving feedback. Like they, you know, responses aren't as good. And they're just like, whatever you think is best. And like, all right, this isn't helpful anymore. So we decided that we had to start uh, crowdsourcing our feedback. So, so we built PickFu out of our own need. Um, we kind of threw it up. We threw it like a PayPal pay button on it. Um, we put on Hacker News and like some people used it. Um, 
Actually, one of our earliest customers was Gabriel Weinberg of DuckDuckGo. Okay. He had used it. He wrote a blog post about it. Um, and so that, that was kind of cool. And then, you know, we, we left it up there and we moved back over to Menuism and kept working on that for a few years. Um, probably like five years ago, I guess, uh, we noticed that PicFu was picking up traction on its own. Um, the whole like lean startup movement um, mm -hmm. was, you know, very, very uh, evolved. And a lot of people were looking for data validation and idea validation and talking to their potential customers and all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that's when we just started, we started spending like half the time on PicFu and then eventually we flipped over all of our time just because we saw that the growth was there and that the potential uh, was much, uh, much higher. And what was great was like the, the customer interaction was so satisfying, right? So with many of them, we didn't actually have customers per se, except for like, you know, our advertisers that we worked with, all that kind of stuff, um, and then users. But that, that's much different than like paying customers who were um, so happy about how we were in, improving their businesses and their lives. Uh, with our service and so that was a great feeling and we wanted to shift over all of our attention to PicFu. Mm -hmm. So talk about who PicFu's ideal customer is. Uh, you know, who, who can, who's best served or who would be best served by that, that system? Sure. Um, so I guess most broadly it's best served by anyone who's just kind of analytical or like data minded. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of what we see across the different industry, seg industry segments, um, within different in industry segments, we've got, uh, what we started with was on for entrepreneurs. Um, that was kind of tough cause like self-funded entrepreneurs like ourselves, like don't want to spend money on things. So that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a little bit of a tough nut to crack. Uh, so the first, uh, other industry was authors actually self-publishing authors they discovered us to test book titles and book covers because it's something that uh, traditionally there wasn't a lot of testing around. You publish it and you, can, you can't test it live. Mm -hmm. You don't want to take it back. There's a lot of costs involved, especially, especially with actual publishing. And I think uh, with the Tim, Tim Ferriss uh, for our work week, he talked about testing his book titles with Google ads. And so I think there was like um, some information out there about being data driven on your titles. And so mm -hmm. that was kind of a movement that, uh, that was taking shape, especially in the self-publishing arena where you didn't have a, a publisher and editor that was helping you make these choices. Uh, so that was great actually. Like, and, and we still get a lot of uh, great authors testing on our platform. Um, soon after that, we, we discovered that there were mobile game and mobile app companies using it because similar problem, right? Where there's a, there's a large um, uh, development costs. Um, when you publish an app, like you can't really take stuff back. Mm -hmm. You can't test on the on the app store live in most situations. So a lot of people were testing all these creatives and when, whether they're app icons or app store screenshots or even the game creatives or app UI um, so that they can just get feedback before sending it off to their very expensive development teams. Um, and the, the newest segment, which we discovered a couple of years ago, which has been super exciting because um, e-commerce has just been taken off. So the advent of these uh, uh, people selling on Amazon or Shopify, and you just have a lot more entrepreneurs and independent people selling products. And um, products is the ultimate thing where, you know, you're going to spend $50,000 on your product mm -hmm. and you kind of need to make sure that it's the right product, it's the right design, the packaging's correct, the branding is correct. Um, when you get it on onto the listing on Amazon, you want to make sure you've got the right photo and the copy and all this kind of stuff. So there's, multiple data, multiple points where you should be collecting data on what, you know, how people react to it and whether it's positive or negative. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. So talk a little bit about what you need to upload a project. Do you guys call them projects or? We call them polls. Um, polls. Okay. Just like, yeah, like they're little preference polls. And so they're pretty simple. It's, and, and we went with a very simple format just to keep it easy for both our customers and for our respondents. And so it's just, a, it's a single question um, and one to eight like additional options, I guess is what we call them. So you could say like, you know, which logo do you prefer and then upload two logos. Um, you could even do something open-ended and say, um, what do you think about this product? Like, 
what questions do you have about this product and just upload an image or a description of what you're planning to sell. And that's interesting because they'll, people will surface things like, you know, uh, is it washable? Is it edible? Like all, all these maybe questions that you hadn't thought about that maybe you should factor into, uh, you know, your product or your copy or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's, it could be text, it could be image, it could be videos. We've got people testing uh, commercials and all that kind of stuff. We used it to test uh, voiceover actors when we were making like an explainer video. Um, so, you know, pretty much literally anything that, that you need to get feedback on. That's really interesting. So for, for a, new, a new company or someone who's looking to launch a company, yep. you can really test pretty well anything, you know, is this a good idea? Would this be something that, yep. you know, can you, do you guys segment your audience as well? So you can, tar or I should say target your audience so you can get certain types of people? Um, yeah, so them. we do have audience targeting. Um, you know, we have all the basic uh, demographic type stuff like age and gender, but we also have some of the behavioral uh, segmentation. So maybe you're a, you're a dog owner or you drink wine or you like coffee, um, take nutri nutritional supplements, kind of all those different things. And we keep adding more of those as, as customers, you know, ask us like, hey, can you target this for me? And we'll mm -hmm. start, you know, gathering that data about our respondents. Um, but yeah, that, that's been uh, incredibly helpful for each of our um, segments that we've been in. So for example, if we have a mobile gamer segment that a lot of our mobile game companies use or Amazon Prime members, that's a lot of our e-commerce sellers use that. And whether they you know, read eBooks or fiction or nonfiction, all that kind of stuff, and that we have that for our authors. So as we go into a new segment, we, we try to surface like what are the different ways that people want to segment their audience and we try to add that into our panel. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Do you have any best practices for the polls? You know, what types of questions work best or yeah. give you the best results? Yeah, I mean, we, we generally try to tell people to be um, uh, somewhat generic, I guess. So like what's worked well, I, I would say like the most generic question you could say is like, which one would you buy? And then, then that kind of works well for like, if you're testing a book title, a book cover, a uh, different product concept, or maybe it's the same product, but testing different images. And you just want to get a sense for like, which one is more appealing, right? Um, so that's kind of like the most generic question that we would offer, uh, recommend. Uh, in some cases, you want to use some context just to make sure, um, mm -hmm. because sometimes you can't tell what that is. And so, you know, maybe you need to say like, oh, this is an electronic shaver, like which one would you buy? Or which design would you buy? If you want to make it clear that these are design variations mm -hmm. as opposed to like uh, color variations or something like that. Um, the uh, tip that we, we always emphasize is to um, not double barrel it, I guess, like not to ask too many questions because you really want them to focus on a single thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, our respondents are supposed to pick which one they like and they're supposed to give a reason why. Uh, but if you try to say like, and what about this? And what about this? And what about this? You know, like three questions in a row, like it's, you know, the, the data is going to be less useful. Um, the other thing I would say, and this is, this is for all testing is that you, you want to try to keep the variations uh, to a minimum. Like ideally you're only varying one thing at a time, right? So uh, you're not changing the color and the text at the same time, because then you're not going to know really what, what the factor was. Mm -hmm. um, and we see a lot of, we see a lot of this when, you know, Authors, for example, might be testing a different book title and a book, different book cover style at the same time. And it's like, no, 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 get the book title right, then move on to the book cover design and then test the, the stylistic things around the, the, the cover, but don't, don't be changing both at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and do you guys have a way to be able to, if, if I wanted to ask additional questions, I could launch additional polls. Uh, will the same people see those same polls or is there a way to be able to uh, filter out the people that have already seen it, or does it not really matter that, you know, it's another poll and they can answer another question, you know, a week from now yeah. or what have you. So we don't have a way for them to filter out the people who previously uh, have done it, but we haven't had that um, become an issue. Like we, we've had some people ask about it, but when they've gone and done multiple polls, like, you know, there haven't been issues uh, with that, you know, being a concern. What you can do is if you have, um, follow-up questions, you can actually uh, ask individual respondents of a poll specific follow-up. So sometimes there's really insightful feedback. So, you know, if you're asking about two different variations and they, they kind of 
key in on an interesting point and you want to say like, can you elaborate on that? You can actually uh, just respond to that person and ask them for follow-up detail, which is super interesting because then you're, you're having that conversation like it's mm -hmm. like an actual focus group then, yeah. um, with actual people. That's great. That's great. Um, what, what's next for you, would you say? What, uh, what are you guys going to get into? Um, well, I, I don't know what we're doing after PickFu, but uh, I think we're, we're just, we're focused really, um, really hard on growing PickFu um, and kind of really owning the, the segments that we're in now. Um, there's a lot of other industries that we want to expand into that we think the application is, is equally good, but, you know, it's just a matter of building up the right organizational structure to kind of uh, pursue everything at a scalable uh, fashion. Um, yeah, we definitely, right now, all of our respondents are U.S. and we want to be able to expand outside of there, um, especially as we've gotten more um, international customers, both for, for mobile and for e-com, especially, they're, you know, they're global. And so while we have a lot of them selling into the U.S. market, they're also starting to sell more into their own markets and, you know, they'd like feedback in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And that actually made me um, think of another question there. Do you, how do you go about acquiring your people that are, are are filling out the polls is there some type of uh, are there are they your own context that you've cultivated or are you pulling them in from some other source yeah so we actually work with a third third party panel service there's a lot of third party panel services out there where you can reach people who are uh, interested in doing surveys online surveys that kind of thing so we work with a third-party service where we've uh, where we pay our respondents to answer these surveys, these polls, as we call them, and then we've built a layer of data on top of that where we've, uh, you know, we've been collecting data about them, and we have all this inf additional information about their demographics and and all the responses they've done and the quality, and so we actually do a lot of uh, like ma machine learning analysis on their responses to make mm -hmm. sure that. Um, uh, a byproduct of, of asking for written responses is that we have something to analyze then, right? As opposed to just like clicks. Mm -hmm. And so we actually feed all of that through it and we score like all the responses and we try to keep the quality high so that we can kind of filter out the people who are, you know, earnestly trying to give feedback and, you know, our customers can also flag people. And so we're always trying to block and reward um, uh, the respondents on our platform. I love it. That's great. That's great. Um, yeah. Yeah, Justin, uh, thanks for uh, for uh, the time here today. If people want to reach out to you or learn more about uh, PickFu, what, what would be the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, so PickFu is on all the social media channels, uh, P-I-C-K-F-U, uh, PickFu.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter at 2 -bit Justin T-W-O-B-I-T, Justin. Excellent, excellent. Well, this has been great. Um, I, I actually am going to be trying uh, PickFu probably later on today, we've got some, some different questions that we've been jumping around all over the place, trying to figure out what the best path would be. So I, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm excited about this. This is cool. Awesome. So yeah, thanks for being on the show and uh, we will chat with you shortly. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Matt.